I'm happy. I don't know about y'all. Y'all happy? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, hey, welcome to Christian Baptist Church. We're grateful to be here with you this morning. And uh, if you're watching online, we're grateful to have y'all as well. And I uh, just wanted to extend a, a hearty welcome. And I want to start out by saying thank y'all uh, if you took part in anything out there uh, last Sunday night at our Fall Fun Fest, whether that be candy or uh, corralling kids or keeping kids away from the fire or whatever it is that you were doing. Uh, we're really grateful. We were able to speak to a lot of people from our community that came, and we were able to provide a lot of sugar to a lot of kids. And so uh, we accomplished our goal. And so thank you all very much for being here and for helping out with that. Um, just a couple of other quick announcements. Uh, we have um, a matching donation going on with our playground. Uh, if if uh, you know anything about that, we've raised quite a significant amount of money towards our playground. And so... There's a matching donation of $5,000, and we're trying to raise that $5,000 to get that $5,000, and uh, that will put us pretty much where we need to be to go ahead and make that purchase on that playground. And so um, if y'all will uh, please help us out with that, uh, we'll, we'll honor the Lord and, and have something for our kids to run around and play on rather than the asphalt outside, okay? And so uh, also LFF is going to be selling... Uh, poinsettias or poinsettias, depending on your druthers there, uh, in memory or in honor of uh, the ones uh, that have gone on before us unto, unto heaven. And so um, uh, there, there's order forms out front that you can fill out and place inside of the tithe and offering box out back. And so uh, that has to be done by November 21st, and we invite you to go ahead and take care of that. Also, LFFs can be meeting on Monday, November 8th. And LAMPS is also meeting on November 18th, okay? And so that pretty much takes care of our announcements, I believe. Just a quick reminder that we will begin, or not begin, we will continue our Sunday nights the way that they've been going, okay, tonight. And so we invite you to be here. Choir practice is happening at 4.30, and uh, we are, are stepping up our Christmas game, okay? And so uh, y'all please come. And if you want to be involved in just the Christmas thing, you're welcome to do that as well and come and and uh, rejoice with us. And so that is it. If you would, let's, uh, let's say a word of prayer and, and, and get this thing started. Lord Jesus, we just want to say thank you this morning, Father, for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. God, thank you for allowing us to be here in your house this morning. God, uh, I, I jokingly talked about the temperature and being in the Lord's house, but it is always a good day to be around our fellow believers and, and, and be in your house, Father. I pray that you would just meet us here this morning as we stand up and we praise your name and, and the choir sings and we have specials and, and preaching, Father. I, I just ask that you would meet us here and that you would affect change in our hearts, Father, that we could be a, uh, a better man or a better woman in, in, in kingdom advancement for you. We're grateful, Father. We love you. Accept our praise as an offering in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Stand up with us. We're going to sing, We Have Come Into the House.
goals to worship him this morning. And uh, we're going to do that in a kind of fun way with this next song, all right? So let's sing the wonderful grace of Jesus. So y'all go ahead and have a seat, okay? We're going to sing this song. It's a song that we used to sing with our teenagers several years back, but it has a powerful message. I hope you listen to the words this morning.
Amen. And it's a blessing to live by faith because we know that God's faithfulness is greater than our faith. And so if you would, please stand. We're going to sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. say that your faithfulness is great, Father. 
And it's hard to see sometimes in the moment, but whenever we turn around and we look behind us, your faithfulness is, is impossible to ignore. And with that in mind, Father, I pray that you would, that you would still our hearts and, and give us courage as we face uh, the, the things that we face in this world today. Father, I pray that you'd be with Brother Scott as he comes to sing. Be with our pastor as he comes to rightly divide the word. I pray that you would uh, act as the potter and mold our hearts into the way that you would have them be today. We love you, Father. We're grateful for you. We ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's take our Bibles and turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And I would have you look around this morning. There are a number of families that are not with us today for sickness uh, and things as serious as uh, heart stuff all the way down to just strep throat and stomach stuff, that kind of thing. So... Uh, a lot of folks, must this weather change must have got a lot of folks. So uh, if you don't see them here, uh, pray for them. They're probably not well this morning. Uh, so uh, we're going to be in John chapter 3, verses 22 through 36. We're going to finish this uh, chapter this morning. And uh, we, we've had the, the luxury the last several weeks of being in passages that were 
very familiar. And, uh, you know, even, even to the extent that we had to warn you of familiarity and not being too uh, caught off guard by that or, or too uh, presumptive in what the sermon or the message would be to remain open to the teaching of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this passage may not be that way. I would imagine if we, if we were to highlight uh, chapter 3, verse 30, which we'll see in a moment, uh, he must increase and I must decrease. Uh, many of you would say, oh yeah, that's a very familiar verse. Uh, you know, I'll quote that. I've remembered that from long ago. Um, I, I'd, I'd, I would be curious to see if you could put it in its right context. Uh, so it's not a very familiar passage. I want you this morning to put your thinking cap on just for a few minutes and uh, to see what's happening here. Many, many scholars call this uh, the swan song of John the Baptist. These are kind of his, kind of his last words. They are not exactly his last words. You'll remember that later when he's in prison, he asked his disciples to go and ask Jesus, art thou the one that is coming? And, and there's, a, there's a conversation in that, but uh, these words are kind of the last uh, pastoral words that John the Baptist would speak, uh, similar to 2 Timothy for the Apostle Paul and 2 Peter for the Apostle Peter. Uh, they are his thoughts of who Christ is and who God is and what is really important in this life. And that's kind of how we're going to approach it this morning. We're going to look at this as lessons from John the Baptizer. And um, I hope that, that you will uh, open your mind uh, to the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit this morning and allow Him to impress upon you the truths of this passage because they're varied. Um, there's, a, there's a picture of diligence that we're going to see in this passage that could be a standalone message. There's a picture of the sovereignty of God that could be a standalone message. There is a picture of some of the divisive work of Satan, that could be a standalone message. So we're going to move a little bit this morning. I, I hope that you'll be uh, tuned in. If you would, if you're capable uh, and able, stand with me as we read our passage this morning. You're standing in honor of the Word of God. We're going to begin reading in John chapter 3, verse 22. After these things came Jesus and His disciples into the land of Judea. And there he tarried with them and baptized. John was also baptizing in Anon near to Salem because there was much water there and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. There arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear witness that I said I'm not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. And he that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. He that hath... And excuse me, and he hath seen, and what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that receiveth his testimony hath set to seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I want you to pray with me and ask the Lord to speak to you this morning. Pray sincerely. 
Ask him to show you something you've not seen before. Something that will change the way you walk when you leave this place today. Father, we thank you for this good day. For your blessings and your mercies. Lord, we're mindful of those who aren't here and we pray for their well-being. But Father, in this moment, I'm concerned about those that are here. Lord, I pray that as we seek to share the truth this morning that we would be ministered to by the Holy Spirit of God, that teaching Spirit of God, the one who authored the text and can truly illuminate them for us. Father, I pray as we look into these truths this morning that we would be receptive to be taught to be convicted, to be challenged, and to be encouraged. And Father, if there's one here today who doesn't know you as their Savior, I pray that that would occur today before it's everlasting too late. Lord, we love you today. We thank you and we praise you in advance for all that you're going to do. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You can be seated. As we look at verses 22 through 24, I want you to see that there are some details here that set the scene, and the details are important, but there's something more there. Just to give you context, uh, if you will, as to what is taking place in this passage, uh, this is uh, shortly after the Lord's interaction with Nicodemus. It is shortly before... John will challenge uh, the leadership and find himself cast into prison and shortly thereafter he'll be beheaded uh, and that ministry will come to an end. It says very simply that Jesus and his disciples are in Judea and there he tarried with them and baptized. For clarification, if you look at chapter 4 verse 2, just on the next page you'll see there that Jesus wasn't baptizing. The disciples were baptizing. Uh, while this is taking place uh, in Enon, uh, there is John, and he's also teaching and baptizing with his own disciples. I'm sure that it would not be uh, a stretch to think that someone could get tangled up in the detail. Why, why is John still baptizing if Jesus is on the scene? And, and to, to what are Jesus and his disciples baptizing uh, the people too. What, what's the purpose of that baptism? I don't want us to get caught in those weeds. I want you to understand they're both baptizing with the same baptism. They're, this is not a Christian baptism. This is not the baptism that we express today. These, these men were teaching uh, and preparing for the coming of the kingdom, and John was preaching that the kingdom was at hand. Uh, the Lord Jesus was there offering to present the kingdom, and they were baptizing people that would repent and be prepared to receive the kingdom. And their baptism was one of repentance. Uh, ours is one unto death. And so we see that both of these things are taking place. They're very similar. Uh, they are both uh, uh, doing this work to a desired end. I would prefer, though, that you would pay attention to rather than just the details that set the scene, but that you would notice there's some diligence on display here. I want you to think about that for a moment. I want you to think that here's John the Baptist. He has not long since baptized the one whom he claims is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, some of his disciples have gone with that individual, but yet they're both teaching and they're both baptizing and I believe that what we see there is this idea of diligence these both of these uh, groups of individuals uh, were sent to accomplish a particular task with a particular people to a particular end and here they are both uh, diligently pursuing that task I would ask you to have begin a little inner dialogue with yourself right now and ask yourself the question if the Lord returned today, would he find me diligently pursuing the task that he's put in front of me? 
See, that's kind of a, it's just a little prod. Should be a little convicting. It, it was for me. You say, well, I'm not John the Baptist. Uh, no, but according to Matthew chapter 28 and, and Mark, cha- or excuse me, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, uh, you are part of a group of people who were sent to another group of people with a particular message in a particular time unto a particular end waiting for a particular event. In other words, you're the born again and you've been instructed to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth and you've been instructed to do that until the rapture of the church occurs. So if the Lord were to look down today, this is free by the way, it's not part of the heart of the sermon. Would he find you diligent in your duty? We see those details of the the scene. And then in verse 25, there is a dispute or a discussion. It's a question of purification. You'll notice then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. I want to call your attention to who these Jews are. And I want you to think about this question for a moment. We've met these Jews already. We met them in John chapter 1, verses 19 through 25, thereabouts. At that moment, they were there asking John who he was, uh, who he was sent from, and what was his purpose. And you'll remember they asked him, are you Elijah? And he said, no. And they said, are you that prophet? And he said, no. And they said, are you the Messiah? And he said, No, I'm the one sent to prepare the way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Remember that? Well, I I would submit to you that this is the same group of Jews. Uh, They are a group of of leadership uh, representing the religious order of the day. And they are here now posing this question, seemingly uh, 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 an innocent question about purifying but I want you to understand that, that there is really uh, Satan's work being done here. The devil's bidding, if you will, because what the true cause of, of, of opportunity here is to create controversy or strife among or between the disciples of John and the disciples of Jesus. And hopefully, if the controversy gets hot enough, it'll even split the two teachers. Because in the, in, the, in the reality of truth, they didn't approve of either baptism. The one that Jesus' disciples were doing or the one that John's disciples were doing. Because neither of them fit within the, the ritualistic purification that the Jews had set forth. And so their thought was, uh, let's, let's divide them. And I would suppose that the question was probably something along these lines. And if you spend enough time reading uh, the interaction between Jesus and the scribes and the Pharisees and, and the religious order, uh, you would agree with me. This is probably what they said. Does your baptism offer the same cleansing as his? And if so... Why are more men going to him than they are coming to you? That's probably how they ask the question. So you're baptizing for purification. Well, no, we're baptizing for repentance. So does your baptism provide a better purification than theirs? Because more people are going to them. I would suppose to you that that's about how they would ask the question. And what we would recognize in that is that it really isn't about the debate or the determination, but rather it is uh, the true desire is revealed in the idea of causing division. Now I want to spend a couple of minutes here. I want you to think about this this idea of division because uh, the, the Holy Spirit really pressed it in upon me this week. I want to say this first. And I I hope that you know this is true. Satan is always seeking to divide. That is his number one goal, is to divide. A house divided against itself itself cannot stand. And so his uh, uh, his favorite opportunity is to divide. And his favorite weapon of division is comparison, just as he does here. Is your your baptism better than theirs? And why do they have more people? See, that's comparison. 
Well, let's look at hermeneutically the idea of a comparison. I want you to think about Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, or the first 15 verses of chapter 3. Satan would come to Eve in the form of a serpent. Do you remember the first thing he said? The first thing he did was compare all of the trees in the garden. Is this tree as good as those? Right? That's comparison. And then he would say to Eve, no, you're not going to die. If you partake of this, you will be like God. That's comparison. That's Satan's oldest trick. When Cain and Abel were born, as soon as the time passed that they were adult enough to bring a sacrifice, uh, Satan would cause a comparison of division to arise in Cain's heart. And it probably went something like this. Look, uh, God loves Abel more than he loves you. God accepted Abel's offering, but he didn't accept yours. There's comparison there. If you just follow the scriptures a little while, you'll find that when Moses was leading the children of Israel, uh, it wasn't long before Korah and his uh, band of miscreants would stand up and say to Moses, you've taken too much on yourself. We can lead as well as you. It's comparison. You remember the ground swallowed them whole. It wasn't long after that that even Moses' own sister, Miriam, would say, why can't we do the priestly duties that you're doing? Comparison. And she would be stricken with leprosy. And so we recognize in in this picture, uh, uh, here, here is this group and they're baptizing and this group is baptizing. Look at verse 26 and listen to how those disciples of John heard that information. They came unto John and they said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men go to him. They've, they've bit it. They've, they have taken the bait of comparison. They're saying, man, he wouldn't even, he wouldn't even have a ministry if it wasn't for you. Uh, you. You're the one that recommended him. You, you're the one that got him started. And look, everybody's going to him. And we see this, this idea of, of the weapon of comparison. And can I tell you something, and, and we'll move on with the passage in a moment. That's happening in your life every day. Every day. You, by nature, you're comparing yourself to other people. The sin nature that is. And when, when you don't do it as a natural reflex... Satan uses the society around you to do it. And it's a, compo- uh, excuse me, a constant comparison of, of this and that seeking to divide and to conquer. So we see this true desire is division. I want you to notice the way that John answers because this is where the lesson is at. This is how you can answer Comparison and division. This is how you can, you can sturdy yourself, galvanize yourself against comparison and division. Notice what John says in verse 27. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said I'm not the Christ, but that I'm sent before him. I want you to see here in this statement, we have a, 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 a clip, a, a glimpse of the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. In, in this particular moment, John is saying to them in so many words, why are you worried about his ministry and how many people are going over there? And why are you comparing mine to his? Uh, we neither one could receive anything except God sent it to us. He would, he would go on to say there, listen, you, I've heard you testify personally that I said I'm not the Christ and that I go before the Christ and that he is the Christ. 
So why would we question this? And we have this, this answer. It's a, it's a graduate level response that, be just quite honestly, most of us never comprehend and even more never apprehend it. I, I've thought about this earlier and I shared this example and, and I wanna, I'm going to talk about the ministry for a minute, and, but I'm going to bring it back to you. I've heard pastors say uh, a lot in my lifetime, well, I hope I don't lose this church. I would hate to lose this church, or I'd hate to lose this position, or I would hate to lose this pulpit. Can I tell you something? When you say that, the indication is that you won it by some contest. And if it were true that you won that pulpit or that position or that appointment by some contest, it would be equally true that you'd have to continue to win the contest in order to keep the pulpit or the position. When the, the, the right estimation is, uh, God gave me this pulpit. God put me in this position. And the only person that can move me from this position then is God. Right? And so, and, that, and look, don't read anything into that. Uh, I mean, we're, we've told you over and over and over again, uh, this is our place. This is where we belong. But if God said move, we'd move. The problem is comprehending the difference between eternal and temporal. And we struggle with that as, as sinful creatures. We struggle comprehending the difference between eternal and temporal because in our opinion, that thing that is good on the temporal level, that's the good thing, but it may not be good on the eternal level. And we have a hard time comprehending that when we, when we think about uh, the, the attitude concerning God's sovereignty, the attitude has to complete the cycle. If God, if, if, if we're talking about this pulpit, if God moved me from this pulpit, then I should be ready to go because I want to be wherever He wants me to be. He's sovereign and everything that comes to me does so through His hand. Now the problem is, how does he communicate that? I think this is where we struggle. And look, I'm going to bring it to your doorstep in a minute. So don't get tired of me talking about the ministry. I think we struggle because we don't know how he brings it. Well, oh yeah, we do, preacher. It's a still, small voice. Sometimes. Elijah would set that example for us, and sometimes it is a still, small voice. But, but you know what the problem is? is that the vast majority of us can't hear the still small voice because we're so covered up in the sounds of society and the world that we're in. So sometimes it's, it may start as a still small voice, but it may turn into a rap on the head. It may look like half of a congregation of people that went from the ministry standpoint that you love and that you thought loved you suddenly feel like you're not the right one there anymore. And, and there becomes this righteous indignation of touching the man of God, but the man of God's got to be in contact with God. For the attitude uh, to, to be right about the sovereignty of God, the maturity is in embracing the sovereignty of God in all things, that He is absolutely in control and rightly so. So we would bring that back to your personal life. Your job, your position, your position in this church, your family, the constitution of your family as it is today, and how it could change tomorrow. And at that point, do we then begin to question fate, luck, and all of these other things, or do we say, sovereign hand of God? And how do we approach that? John says, nothing can come to a man except it come from the hand of God. I want to address something I think is, this is divisive in and of itself. But I'm always honest with you, and I'm being honest with you this morning. And so if you don't agree with it, I'm happy to speak with you later. Uh, you need to understand, uh, we're creatures of free will. We are creatures of free will. So that means, if I'm a creature of free will, that means that I can choose to, to, to do wrong. I can choose to cheat. I can choose to, to murder. I can choose to steal. 
I could choose to smoke dope. I could choose to do drugs. I can make the choices. I'm a creature of free will. And when I make that choice, there is a set of, of circumstances, of repercussions that are obviously going to occur because I made that choice. At that moment, I can't blame that on the sovereign hand of God because I chose that for myself. And I would give you uh, Cain as an example in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. Cain is all emblazoned against Abel. Abel's made a right sacrifice. Cain's made a wrong sacrifice. Satan's done his work in the heart of Cain. And Cain is boiling with anger. And God comes to him and says, why are you mad? Why are you mad? And listen to what he says. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. But... If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire. The caveat in that passage is if you do well. So when, when Cain chooses not to do well, he chooses to murder Abel, and then God uh, bans him from population, that, that sovereign hand of God that came upon him is a result of the choice that he made. He has taken that and he has chosen that for himself. So that means that if you are in the Lord's will, if you do well, everything that comes your way will be well intended by the sovereign hand of God. Well intended. Well intended. Temporal or eternal. Well intended. So you say, so you're telling me if I'm faithful and true, my life is going to be a cakewalk. No, because that may not be well intended. You look at the, the book of Job. Look at the example of Job. God would say of Job that he was perfect and upright and eschewed evil. God spoke that word concerning Job. Yet Job would lose... All of his livestock, his houses, his kids. The only thing he got to keep was a nagging wife. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did that hurt your feelings? I'm sorry. Uh, listen, they, I mean, she's, she did it. I didn't. She's the one. So he's, that's the only thing he got to keep. He even lost his friends. But, but what does the scripture say? God blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. So everything that came to Job was well intended. Did he enjoy it? Absolutely not. Can we wrap our minds around that? Can we, can we literally sit here, legs crossed, eyes open and say, well, you know, if, if God cursed my whole family, took everything I had, uh, put boils all over me, had my friends turn against me, if God did all that, I would be fine with it because I would know it was well intended. You're a liar. You wouldn't. You, you, would, you would kick against that. You would, be, you would have the same inclinations that the friends of Job had. You would think that you earned it or you deserved it or, or God had turned his back on you. And then God would say to you like he did Job, Hey, were you there when I created this thing? You don't know what the, what the well-intended eternal glory of God looks like. But... We have to take the stance that when John says everything, my mother's favorite verse, and it didn't become her favorite until I came along because I'm such a gift. <laughs> but my mother's favorite verse is James 1.17. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. She, she writes that. I don't think she writes that for my brothers. I'm pretty sure she don't. I think it's when she gives me a card. Listen, uh, it, everything we have comes through the hand of God. From the hand of God. It's, it's not about uh, this life or this minute or this week or, or this ministry. It's about eternity and the eternal glory of God. And John would say, look, a man can have nothing except it comes from the hand of God. That means your job, your health, your wealth, your happiness, your marriage your children, your grandchildren, your possession, 
All of that belongs to God. Every bit of that belongs to God. God owns everything. Everything. So how can we get so inflamed when the rightful owner of something takes it? Because we have a sin nature. That, that means that if it belongs to Him, if you have it, it's because He's given it to you and if He mains his right, maintains His rightful place in your life, you can trust the sovereign hand of God to your eternal good and His eternal glory. And that's, that's it. John said, you can have nothing. But, but, but He wouldn't have them. You can have nothing. But all over going to Him, you can have nothing except it come from God. And I love the idea that John says to them, you, you heard me say that I'm the one going before. You heard me say that He was the Messiah. You've heard me say it so much that you even testify to it. Does that sound familiar? And would you expect me to act differently because of the circumstances? I think I'll just keep on doing what we've been doing. We see that doctrine of the sovereignty of God. Look at verses 29 through 30. I love this, this clip right here. Uh, listen, I may, be the, I may be the latest one to the party. But I'm just going to say to you all as my friends, if you knew the depths of this passage and you've not shared it with me yet, shame on you. So I'm expecting you don't know it. And I'm expecting this will be special for you. Look what he says in verse 29. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's joy voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. I want you to see this as the definition of Christian duty. I want you to know who the friend of the bridegroom is. <laughs> the word, the Greek word is paranymphe. And so you think of nuptials. And paranymphe is the, the one alongside the nuptials. But we've, we've changed that to the best man. Okay, but the best man in our culture is nothing like the friend of the bridegroom in that culture. So in that culture, and, and, and you all may know this, so just stick with me for a moment. But in that culture, a, a boy and a girl would be betrothed to one another. And then they would be separated for a period of time, about a year. And they would not be interacting. They wouldn't be mingling. They wouldn't be holding hands, smooching face, going out to Papa John's, none of that. They would not be around each other. You know where the husband, the bridegroom would be? He would be building a room onto the father's house so they would have a place to dwell. John chapter 14, I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many mansions, rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. The bridegroom has gone to prepare a place for us. That's what they did in that culture. He'd go to build a room. She's over here maintaining her purity. Remember Joseph and Mary? They were betrothed to one another. She was found to be expecting of the Holy Spirit. It messed up her purity in the eyes of everybody watching. Remember that? So the, the, the bride is over here maintaining her purity. Spoiler alert, the church is the bride. He's gone to prepare a place. We're supposed to be maintaining our purity. Then this paranymphe, uh, this friend of the bridegroom, he would go to the bridegroom and, and the bridegroom would say, go tell her that I love her. Go tell her about this room I'm building. Go tell her I can't wait to see her and that bridegroom would go to the bride and he would say he loves you so much you ought to see this beautiful house that he's building for you he can't wait to see you he's so excited and she would say go tell him that I'm so excited to it I can't wait and he'd go back he say man she's so excited she can't wait and then that blessed marriage day would come and that paranymphe would grab that bridegroom by the arm and march him to that bride. And there'd be a room prepared for him. And he would put him in that room where she was and close the door. And he would turn his back. And he would hear the joy of that union. 
in that reunion of that man and woman that loved each other so much. And because of that, his joy would be fulfilled and he would decrease and the bridegroom would increase. That's a picture of how the Holy Spirit is sharing with us, the believer today. Look, He's coming. He's going to come back and get you. He's preparing a wonderful place for you. Hey, keep your purity. He loves you so much. He can't wait for the day of reunion. It's also a picture of what we ought to be doing today. John here uh, identifies himself by this passage as a, an Old Testament prophet who walked into the New Testament. He's not part of the church. He's not part of the bride. He's not part of the bridegroom. He's just introducing them. He's a picture of the Holy Spirit. But you and I, we ought to be so consumed with the Lordship of Christ that that's all we talk about. And we ought to be so excited about the marriage supper of the Lamb that we want to help the bride maintain her purity. And we want to share messages from the bridegroom to the bride and encourage one another. Our whole life would be consumed with that so that we could say, this in this my joy is fulfilled. And I would ask you that question. Is Christ the Lord of your life like that? Is your life consumed with knowing Him and carrying His message to the prospective bride? Are you comfortable with the sovereign hand of God in your life? Comfortable enough to say, Lord, whatever your will. Whatever your will. Look at verses 31 through 35. There's, there's a defense right here of the deity of the Savior. And he, and he says this so plainly. This is John the Baptist speaking. He says, listen, he that is from above is above all. I'm just, I'm just an earthly guy with an earthly message. And I'm telling you earthly things. But he is telling you the things that he's seen and he knows he's from heaven. He's above all. He's God. And he that receives that testimony is accepting that God is true. For he that God has sent is speaking the words of God. And God didn't give him a little measure of the Spirit. He gave him the Spirit without measure. Because Paul would say, in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead Bodily, the Father loved the Son and gave Him all things. He's God. And He should be treated as such. And we see the deity of the Savior. And John seals his testimony in verse 36 with that doctrine of salvation that, listen, the one that believes on the Son has everlasting life, but the one that does not believe won't even see life. The wrath of God rest upon him. It's a, it's a re, repeat of, of, of if you believe, you're not condemned, but if you don't believe, you're condemned already. Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost, not to condemn, but to save. But there's a choice, and it's yours. You're literally choosing between heaven and hell. You're literally choosing life and death. And if you do nothing, you've chosen already. Would you stand with me this morning? And your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. I don't know your need this morning. I don't know how that message landed on you. Maybe you're encouraged. Maybe you're excited. Maybe, maybe you want to thank the Lord for that, but possibly you would say, I I'm not sure. You can be positive. You can know.
The Bible says that repent and believe the gospel. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. And call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. Maybe this morning you want to come down and pray for our nation, our community. Maybe this morning you want to come down and pray for your own salvation. I don't know your need. But I do know that the altar's open. I know that the Lord will meet you here. I wish that you would come. Father, I pray you'd bless this time of invitation in Jesus' name. Would you come this morning? Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, and I am the clay. Mold me and make. to thy will while I am waiting yielded and still will have thine own way Lord have thine own way Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Brother Benji Boone, would you close us in prayer this morning, sir?